So welcome back to the Women Matters in the Wisdom Factory. We have been meeting again twice so far, uh, talking about Corona in the last few weeks. And as we are still under the influence of Corona, I thought today, let's talk about leadership. Let's talk about feminine leadership and how we could imagine, and maybe we see it in the world, that it might be different from masculine leadership. So it's just a, a moment to think about in the countries which are led by women, if there is a difference. And if so, what is the difference? And then talk about female feminine leadership or together what we imagine we could do in the future as women, maybe in a different way as we see it today. Uh, before we do a short uh, check-in, I'm Heidi Hörnlein, I'm in Italy, and I run the wisdomfactory.net in English and also in German. And I love to do these uh, conversation groups. I have created another one in German, another one in English, and so <laughs> it's, it's wonderful uh, to, to talk with people all over the world, think about who we have from all countries. <laughs> not all countries, but all different countries who we are together. And uh, yeah, I'm not much affected by the strange situation we are living in. I'm sort of living in my own bubble in my country and do my vegetable garden and I'm a lot on Zoom. And I enjoy to meet people. It's almost like in person, not really, but a good substitute, better than telephone in my opinion. So uh, did I say I'm in Italy? So I would love to go over to South Africa. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. <clears throat> I'm Anneli Venusha. I'm from, I'm born South African, global citizen these days. Um, yeah, it's very interesting what's busy happening. And I'm also living in my bubble. Not much have changed besides the human contact. Um, I have been doing lots of Zooms over the last few years, so this is not really new, but I do miss the human contact as well. And feminine leadership is something that's very close to my heart. So I'm also curious to see what unfolds here today between us ladies. What country do you want to hear next? We have Austria, we have Germany, we have the UK, and then we have a mixed thing between Canada and Netherlands. <laughs> I can go. Um, I am in the Netherlands from Canada and um, yeah, I, I've been just in touching on the topic. I've been really watching uh, Jacinda Ardern's leadership in New Zealand in terms of the coronavirus. And yeah, really appreciating being able to have uh, an example, a great example for me of how I, I see feminine, female leadership um, holistically meeting a situation while being honest and uh, firm and clear. So um, yeah, and it's good to be here. It's good to see everyone and be able to connect. Who goes next? Let's go to UK, to Anne. Oh. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name's Anne Roberts. I'm in Scotland. And uh, now it's really interesting for me because uh, and my present condition is I'm in good shape. Um, the only challenge has been that my immediate family has had the virus and but mild. So I've had a good experience of what happens when, you know, around testing and length of time and their partner hasn't got it. So and the children have got you know, so, but but it, it's just been interesting. Uh, my life, my life has changed in probably in quite a good way. Um, oh, it's okay. Go ahead. Just keep going. Um, we found wonderful walks locally, you know. So we've got really connected into the 
the local situation um, in terms of finding really great walks. Um, and David and I are just finding a new rhythm of living in our home in a particular way. Lots of work has come in, you know, um, which is interesting because I've been in this online environment for a while. I run programs online um, for elders. So I'm, I'm really into the elderhood. Um, in terms of the topic, I, I could be a little bit scratchy around this, so I'll declare that now. Um, I taught leadership in the police service, and so I'm really interested in the feminine and the masculine in all humans. So I think men can bring forward beautiful feminine leadership, you know, so I want, I want to hold that um, clarity. Uh, but certainly f seeing women in leadership roles is, is something I'm very interested in. But I've seen some women who are very masculine in their leadership behaviour. So uh, just holding a clarity of how we speak uh, about um, the individual and then we're into the integral bit and you know the uh, the whole um, types thing of uh, that as well is interesting. And when you get to mature masculine, mature feminine, they have very similar qualities, you know. So I'd love to play with all of that. Um, I'm complete. Uh, and let's go to, well, let's bring Christine in to welcome her into our circle. Good morning. Sorry for being late today. Um, yeah, I'm doing okay with the uh, quarantine. It's, you know, <laughs> the days, in some ways, the days seem to fly by and are busy. And in other ways, because they're very similar to one another, it seems like they don't go by very quickly because it's, you wake up and it's the same thing again. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going okay. Uh, went out this week. Um, we had an event here in Carlsbad at the ocean where uh, because of recent rains, there's this bioluminescence that happened in the ocean where the plankton gets stirred up and it creates neon, blue neon um, in the surf. And it was just beautiful. And it was kind of fun because the police were chasing people away and uh, <laughs> they wouldn't let us linger, um, even stand still. You just weren't even allowed to stand still still and take a picture. So um, that was kind of interesting. Speaking of women leadership, the, uh, the police were out in force chasing, uh, chasing people away with their cameras. Um, but that was my big event for the week to be able to go outside and, and do that. And um, otherwise it's been okay, doing work from home and you know, just trying to get along with my husband, enjoying these meetings. I don't know if everybody has talked about women in leadership. Have, has that topic started? Not okay. yet. We're still in the checkout round. We still okay. have the German speaking part. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I continue. I'm Monia and I live in Vienna in Austria. And I haven't been affected by Corona for five weeks because I had a flu and was very sick in bed. Uh, and now I'm becoming aware of what's going on and my daughters are working at home, home office. The younger one is baking most of the time, continuing to bake and her partner has already gained a lot. <laughs> and uh, I am in the virtual world. So it's quite amazing. Actually, I, the old one, should be baking and she should be holding uh, conferences, but she doesn't. So. We had just two days of a marvelous meeting, online meeting of the Integrale Forum, German speaking integrals. And I'm full of that still. And uh, leadership was quite feminine in by men and women, I should say. So it was a very, very interesting, nice event. And yeah. I'm used to the virtual world, so it's not really anything 
anything new or disturbing. I like it. I just like our talks and I'm used to them. Okay, Gertraud, you're next. Thanks, Sonia. Um, actually, I'm jealous. I didn't know that it was taking place, the integral event. Um, so, uh, I just heard about it <laughs> from you. Um, I was uh, I was working from home uh, all the last eight ten years, so more telephone wise, and sometimes with um, online. Um, so a lot of I couldn't no Tammy if there was no <laughs> Zoom calls. <laughs> so um, yeah, that Tammy, Heidi and I met how how many years ago? Some some. Um, that was what? what? I think it was January twenty seventeen. Yeah. So this is for me quite normal. What's not normal that my husband is at home most of the time. He's a photographer, event photographer, theater and things like that. So 95% of his business went down. So he's coping with it and starting to teach in online and things like that. So um, quite a busy life, but not so different. And we went to buy a house and through Corona, we really got to um, uh, appreciate countryside. <laughs> so, so we don't want to move into the city. That's, that's where we got just three minutes out and then we can go for a walk. Yeah, so for leadership, we, I will hold that <laughs> till we all um, checked in. I think we all checked in, so we, we could start. I, I would first go back to what Tammy said about the leadership in New Zealand. Could you tell us a little bit what you know and what is so particular in your eyes? Uh, well, she was just really frank, clear, and direct in her communications. Um, and it was, I, I didn't really, she, I didn't really check it out until uh, maybe a month, uh, five weeks ago. So I didn't see it live. But when I went back and, and watched her first press release to the, uh, uh, for, for the uh, citizens, I was like, Wow that's that's what I, how I would want my uh, leadership to uh, to to do it um, very frank um, talking about the 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 we um, really impressive impressing upon people that they that were in this together we can't do it without every of the five million New Zealanders um, and, uh, yeah, she just was very human in her approach. Now, uh, as a, just to add on to that, I also watched, um, Angela Merck, uh, like the chancellor speak as well and in, in German and it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't translated, but I also had the same feeling. I had a very similar feeling, um, to Angela Merkel's address as well. Very frank, very clean, very clear, um, not trying to not trying to blow it up or mitigate how uh, awful it actually is and the realities of it. So both of those leaders, I think, had a lot of similarities in in just very grounded nuts and bolts human approach to how they how they presented it to the citizens. So what would be different to masculine approach, which we have seen in the world? <laughs> and they frank, uh, direct? Well, no, I don't think so. I think that there's a lot of posturing and um, 
assuming, I mean, obviously on the extreme uh, wrong end rather than right end of the spectrum, there's the Bolsonaro's and the Trumps of the world um, who have uh, ostriched, this isn't really happening. And then uh, pretended like they had things together that they didn't um, and playing some of the worst kind of uh, politics as well as not at all a human approach. Uh, so I think both of those male examples of how leadership rolled out in the, in the epidemic and pandemic is, is exactly the antithesis. Well, <laughs> in Austria, we have a very young chancellor. And as far as my impression was that Germany was just lagging behind what he announced, but he never announced it just as a single person. There was always a team. There was the health minister, the financial minister, the interior minister, and each of them was very frank, very clear. Uh, no exaggerations, but uh, that everybody, every single person is needed in contributing. So this is what they really hammered all the time that everybody has to be very careful and particularly uh, guarding the older generation. And I was just shocked by what happened in Italy and happened in the United Kingdom and happened in America. And I'm very glad we don't have a chancellor or a Trump as a chancellor. <laughs> I really have to say that, yeah. To respond about Italy, um, I think if we had the other one who was there before, that would have uh, something like Trump. But this one has behaved quite, I have the impression that he is seriously trying to, to address uh, the topic, you know, although it was late too. Also, we were also the first ones to complete shut down. But um, yeah, we are lucky not to have stayed with the Salvini guy. I'll go um, next. What, oh. When I have observed um, some men speaking because they want to make sure that they assert and have some power behind their words, it seems like they become too focused on making a point. You know, they really want to drive home their message. And I think women's style is a little bit more um, inclusive. They're not trying to just say one message as much as give perspective. Um, so they'll touch upon maybe a couple of things that broaden. So to me, you know, this is an overgeneralization, but I, I think men tend to narrow and focus a message and women have a tendency to make things a little bit broader in perspective. So it, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting for me. We have a woman, a woman first minister and we've had her for about 10 years, Nicola Sturgeon. And she is quite masculine, but she is impressive. Um, and what I'm interested in is how worldviews are guiding the, um, the reliance on science for how the messaging comes forward. Um, so, and how that, rolls out you know with with who's presenting and that comes over for me whether it's a woman or a man speaking as grounded in the orange worldview and that that's difficult for me sometimes to take because one of the things I'm really interested in at the moment is what's called immune resilience and the science is not behind immune resilience as the answer it's more about getting the vaccination done. And, you know, so the whole strategy for me is very grounded there and it's being led in an orange worldview way. So I'm not sure I have an answer. Um, and the other thing I would say is Boris Johnson got the virus and was seriously, seriously ill. 
he could have died and was in hospital, you know. So there's that empathy piece of how he is behaving. But there's also the whole history that we have of how the Conservative Party is a masculine party, essentially. So, or a male party, I watch my language, a male party. Um, and so there is something quite tough about it all for me that doesn't have what Christine was saying around that wider perspective. I think it's very interesting what you say, Anne, uh, because I, I think it's masculine or male and female and the, the um, stages uh, coming together in a way <laughs> or not. Um, and I see like if you come from a red or a blue or ember, apart it it's it's more like the masculine is more i say what the truth is <laughs> not uh, so this is a very big advantage to come from the orange perspective from that part so and angela merkel is a quantum physics uh, doctor so when she explained it like how how does it when you have one point uh, or zero point nine people infected, then you de decrease. And if you have one point one infected, then we will be at the end of our scale when it comes to hospitals in October. If it's one point two in August, if it's one point three in in July, so or June. So it's it's kind of really like so this orange part is really very good compared to like <laughs> some people in the states or Savini or whoever. Um, and what you say it's beyond this. How can how can that go beyond and without making the orange wrong? really taking what is and, and, and all the, the, yeah, what's so, <laughs> the, the facts, and then scale it up. So, so I think in comparison, the orange view is a lot better, <laughs> but maybe there's a little bit more to it and, and uh, more possibilities without just throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater. And Boris Johnson, I mean, he transformed by, by getting sick himself from before. So there's also a learning curve for some politicians. In, in, what, in what way has he transformed? I think there is more empathy, more, um, and not dismissing science, what he did before. It's, it's more like, okay, that's really serious. So let's, let's talk on another level about it than before. I, I, his speech, I, when I listened to it, it was different before and after hospital. I'm also wondering about how much this is a part of the systems. Uh, what really came to mind is that uh, the parliament in the United Kingdom, they sit together like they did in the Middle Ages, one next to the other. So uh, in our parliament or of course they closed it but in our parliament they now sit about one meter apart from each other and they have this mass but it's so difficult i felt when we watched all these uh, until johnson was uh, elected we watched it on bbc and and we were just amazed how 
in the like in the Middle Ages, they behaved and they and there was the speaker and they stood up and they sat down and they just sat. They didn't even have something to put their notes on. They just sat one next to it. And how and they do shout. you? They shout. They shout. Yeah, yeah. They the shout at each other. They shout the front at each other. So, and how can you stand this kind of parliamentarism? It's so interesting. Um, recently, there was a series called the Wreath Lectures by, oh, I can't remember his name, a lord, about our democracy. And I found it absolutely fascinating because the last year of watching what was going on in uh, our parliament was because we moved from a democracy that moves by consensus in the parliament to one that was representative, which was the referendum. And we had a referendum that was a binary question, but we actually have a democratic process that looks for the best solution between. And so we have actually a very effective parliamentary system but not if you introduce referendums, because then our system is not able to implement that decision. Because if you think about in and out as a slider, as a polarity, you're either in or you're out, you know, you're yes or no. Um, actually, the parliamentary democracy was looking for something that was a blend, that was acceptable to all. And there was no process in our system to find that blend that anyone would sign up, enough people would sign up to. So I think there's been huge learning for us as a country about the use of referendums to settle difficult decisions. And we're not out of Brexit by any means. Um, and I think we are, we are on a trajectory now of a Conservative government with a huge majority for the next five years, with a Labour um, opposition that's in, at the moment, in disarray. I could go on about this forever. It's been a year of interest for me to follow it, and we're not out of it. And we're not out of Europe yet either. And how are we going to get out of Europe at the moment with what's going on? It's really scary. But I'm sorry. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> coming back to the feminine aspect. Yes. <laughs> Do you see any feminine you can, aspect? You can cut all of this out, uh, no, Heidi. No, no. <laughs> Uh, do you say um, you said your your parties are very uh, masculine? No, that so that will be means that this sort of decision is masculine. I would like to invite Han. She hasn't spoken yet, and I have heard uh, good things about her president, not her president, but the president of um, uh, <laughs> South Africa, and I wonder what she has to say about that. <laughs> it is very interesting um, what's been happening since we. We got into lockdown. <clears throat> In the beginning, when we last met, when I was with you girls last time, there was a sense of unity and our president was, he surprised everybody. And a lot of people gained respect for him in the way he spoke up. He was also very frank, uh, very open. But then later he introduced the police state and that didn't go down well at all. It's curfews at night, it's inconsistency of applying rules and uh, regulations. So it seemed like his, his parliament is getting slack because of weak leadership. And some of his female ministers, they try a spy type politics. We will spite you. If you don't listen to us, we will spite you and we'll do this and that and the other. So threatening. So it's like his parliament, his, his ministers are degrading the, the power of which he spoke in the beginning. That he's not supported in that. And he had a lot of compassion as well. And I think that's where, where the feminine leadership part comes in. Because our society is so broad and we have so many vulnerable people um, in the way it's now policed, it's inhumane because it's actually against those who are less fortunate, not those who are fortunate. 
So when I sense in Tibet, in the beginning, I was totally behind in myself because of the way he presented it and everybody bought into it. But suddenly with the police state, um, it, it doesn't go down well at all. Bringing the military for no specific reason. And it's so, it's, it's a weird situation currently. People are very uncomfortable. It seems like curfews and likes are kind of going back into the past to show what it feels like to be in a curfew because of what happened in apartheid. So people see it as spite politics. Instead of looking what's really happening, we've got so many disadvantaged people. Uh, our informal business um, aspects in this country is 90% of business, it's informal people. They don't have registered businesses. Now, just to give you an example, in terms of um, what's been happening is almost a thousand of our schools have been burned down since the lockdown. Well, there's no reason for it. And uh, vandalized. And um, from a prosperity point of view, the informal people with informal businesses is going to get $20 to help them. <laughs> what can you do with $20, even in South Africa? It's in, you can't live off that. And again, and this big businesses, corporates can apply for, you know, to get uh, financial assistance from banks and the likes, because they've, they have, you know, they have something. So that the inequality is just coming out more and more now. And not even in terms of health, just in terms of well-being, overall well-being. So it's a very interesting situation where he, our president, the country's president, really showed leadership. But the execution of it is falling flat. And we don't know whether he doesn't have enough voice to, with, with his parliament, what the situation is. But the moment the country is... And then we also had a very a downgrading in our financial, on our financial side at the same time. So, so we won't get easily investors into the country. So the female leaders that, that is part of our parliament, they are the ones actually making, um, yeah, making it a disaster, some of them, which is sad because they act like males, but worse, like weak, weak masculine. And um, so it's going to be interesting to see what now develops. And um, in terms of the health part, um, our numbers are still low. It's compar comparing to other countries. You talk about New Zealand, uh, Tammy. We've got 5 million people just in Johannesburg um, in terms of our country. So it's, again, we don't know what the real numbers are yet because of testing abilities and the roll on effect you know, of people getting out there. But in terms of feminine leadership, um, I personally also feel that compassion and I love what you said about the, whole, the wholeness part. The, um, seeing the whole versus just, just a specific point. And considering all, both and, not either all. Um, I was going to bring up maybe a, a less political and more psychological angle to this. Um, parenting styles. Um, I think men often uh, emulate a parenting style from their father that they may have seen, which is often uh, more authoritarian. You know, dad, wait till your dad gets home and dad's going to come home and lay down the law and this is the way it is because I said so. And um, females may look more to their mother's leadership style in the family and how their mother approached leadership. Supposing that she could approach leadership, of course, in a lot of families, women don't have that role, but, but in many families, um, dad had certain leadership responsibilities and the mother had other leadership responsibilities. So I'm wondering if women look to how they were raised by their mothers in terms of how they may approach making decisions and communicating what's important. And often kind of with, you know, values embedded 
in how they want to lead in a family, not just about, you know, laying down the law. Um, in California, uh, they let up a restriction about going to the beach and it happened to be on a beautiful weekend. And in some portions of California, people just flocked to the beach and they didn't, um, they didn't mind all the social distancing. I mean, I mean, they didn't do the social distancing that they were supposed to. And it was, you know, considered a pretty big failure because people were not being responsible. But this happened in a, a fairly select portion of the state. And so what the governor did was rather than close down all the beaches throughout the state, because most of them had been complying, he decided to be selective and close down those uh, closed down beaches in those areas where people had not abided by the rules. And I think, um, you know, people wondered how he was going to approach this. And I think the fact that he kind of looked more carefully, like, you know, rather than, okay, I don't know who misbehaved at home, but all the kids are grounded. <laughs> I don't care if it was Johnny or, or Susie, but you're all in trouble. Um, he wanted to look at it more specifically and, and really kind of tease that apart. And, you know, people responded well to that, that he didn't just come down with this blanket uh, authoritarian stance on uh, closing all beaches because there were a couple of bad examples. So I don't know, you can also maybe look at the lens of parenting and parenting styles and the difference there between uh, men and women. I know in my own family, you know, my dad was more authoritarian and, and it, um, there wasn't any questioning of it, of his rules or, you know, what he wanted to have happen. You, you didn't question that. My mother was, of course, more soft about it. And you could ask a question <laughs> and maybe try to understand it a little bit better because she would dialogue a little bit more. Um, so I, I think some of that we see in our leaders, whether the leader is male or female, but they may be looking at parenting styles that they were uh, accustomed to seeing in their own home. When I look at the different people in leadership at Corona, um, people like Cuomo or so, they are quite uh, tough guys. So, and in this circum those circumstances, there is empathy, there is clarity. So, um, sometimes I think that in the mode of crisis that the real character comes through and and people step up to the occasion and and really become a lot uh bigger than they have than we have seen them before and and some diminish <laughs> some people really get yeah really like uh regress um and and so i some I don't know if it's it's really male or female and the empathy comes in and clarity I think it's not so uh, important if if they are able to to really look at people that are less fortunate and if they are able to to be with what's so and then come up with solutions so um Tammy was talking about the, the New Zealand uh, uh, Prime Minister. I think she is, she's everything that, <laughs> that you would like to have in a leader. I mean, taking her baby with to the, to the UN um, su summit and yeah and really caring and and talking to people while doing the groceries and and really being with the people and really knowing what what people really being human and at the same time uh 
being with what's so and and looking for good solutions for everyone so and and thinking about not excluding anybody so it should work for everyone and i think that so i'm i'm not so sure female male <laughs> because i see now some leaders that are male and really good leaders in that crisis so that's my two uh, cents if you take a look at the facebook side of the integrale forum they have uh, how corona and the stages of your consciousness how complex you are thinking mm -hmm. and it's quite interesting i just read it this afternoon and in german is it uh, I have I'll, I have to look up the link, but it's the Facebook side of Heidi. You know that too. Of the you posted it actually, I believe. Yeah, I will look it up and post. Yeah, please. It. Maybe you can put it in the chat. Uh, because um, for us, one of the problems is imported. Uh, the recent infections were by uh, migrants who lived on rather in rather cramped conditions and they were now they needed a, tra a translator or an interpreter to talk to them and to explain to them why they have been will be transferred 400 people why they will be transferred to uh, another location where they will be quarantined so they were quarantined but some tried to escape of course they didn't know really what was going on and yeah so this is it is a question of your stage of complexity how you can handle a situation not so much male or female i believe in this regard that's my opinion so i would like to pick up on christine's point about parenting i was chair of an organization called the fathers network scotland which was an organization that wanted to support fathers to be fully involved in their families because much of the government uh, communication and the legal system and what have you often favored the mother um, and the fathers were one, you know, you would get a, a, a brochure on breastfeeding and there wouldn't be one male image of the father with his arms around mum and baby or, you know, and the fathers wanted to respond to that. And they, they said you were either dangerous or a duffer, they would say. And so I think there is a movement um, for men to find their place. Um, I also... I'm interested in grandparenting. I've done some research on grandparenting. And I watched my, my husband, who was a typical father, I would say, who went out to work and maybe wasn't. And, and he's so different as a grandfather. So there's something around the contribution of grandfathers and grandparents, grandparents to that developing of uh, leadership capabilities coming out of that. And then the final thing, question I've got is, I would love there to be more balanced leadership in the media. I watch our politicians battling with a hostile media. I'm not saying we shouldn't have a media that is incisive, but it's repetitive and it's focused on what's not right rather than what they might be getting um, r right. And, and I think you're right. Was, was it Gertrude, did you say that, that people have risen to the challenge in many ways and are trying to find a pathway through incredible complexity, economically, socially, culturally. Um, and I would love some feminine leadership in our media that can bring balance there. No, we had Diva. I was like, we had Diva. You go ahead. Oh, 
What's going on? Is the uh, internet unstable? I think we had a glitch. Yeah. 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 So I was. I thought Mona was Mona. I was speaking. Um. Mm -hmm. No, it was just as you were speaking now, and and <clears throat> Christine about the parenting. Um. I couldn't help think back when Madiba passed, Nelson Mandela, because it felt at that time he was a father. You know, he was he was like protecting everybody. And, um, and we all said that at that time, our nation needed a mother to, uh, to bring everything together uh, because everybody was so distraught and didn't know what was going to happen. And it feels to me like now as well that um, that sense of being safe is easier perhaps for females to, to provide because of the mother role, the nurturing part, um, although there are many men who can, who do, who can do the same, who, who are doing the same, but it's in such times, the, the sense of feeling safe um, that uh, no matter what happens, we can, we can do something about it. And I also just always question, why do we go into what's not working? We're not sharing how many people are healing showing how people are dying and we also don't build on our strengths so that's not masculine or feminine it's for me a combination of both as well you see what is strong at the moment and um, what is working because lots is working we are breathing we are here we can we can envision other realities from here on for those who are you know are worried about the economic side and what's going to happen with the beautiful families, how they're going to pick, put their children for school. So I think we can really stay beyond this to really go into our own strengths. And that's a holistic view. I think for the female, it is much easier to see the whole picture sometimes, but same with some males as well. But it's easier for us, it's more natural for us. For some, you know, because we were carrying in the womb and um, the feminine is more the holding one where the masculine is more directing. But we, we need a combination of both now. We can't just go with the one. Yeah, and um, the question is, you say um, that the masculine is uh, holding people safe. And that's what they try at the moment by all these rigid measurements. Uh, the feminine, I don't think a feminine uh, mentality would allow people to die with uh, in, alone surrounded by people like, you know, uh, it is and uh, nobody of their family around. So the family, uh, um, for me, the female or let's say better feminine urge would be to be with the person who is dying and to hold their hands instead of keeping them isolated. And, and even the people who are not uh, ill, no, they are isolated, the old people in their houses. And I was thinking, in Italy, still they cannot go to the, um, to the hairdresser for three months. I know how it was important for my mother that the hairdresser came and every two weeks she had a, a nice look at, so that she could maintain a dignity. When this is, uh, all these things are negated to, to older people, especially those who cannot do these things anymore for themselves, uh, I wonder what is more important, you know? Is it important that they live two hours longer or two days longer or even two weeks longer? Or if they have a decent surrounding in which they can feel, yeah, uh, to have a, a dignity. And that would for me be the feminine care, you know? Uh, and not, not so much the masculine is how you are safe because we have closed you like this, you know? <laughs> My mind is a bit blown because we've got a lot of threads open. Um, and uh, I, I want to tag back to um, the different examples of leadership, parenting being a perfect, perfect, ubiquitous one for everyone. And that's partly where we learn leadership. Um, but also, and you brought up the media and how it would be nice to have balance there. And I think that if I look at uh, the multi-systemic point of collapse we're at, media is where I see 
some of the most uh, egregious bending of reality. We're, we're literally being, um, it, well, it feels like we're, we're, we're in a, information's being weaponized and that's through, it's being mediated through the corporation of the media, which is very different than uh, what it is to mediate information directly like we're doing here. So um, then pointing back really to, to us and what we're doing here, I think this is a great example of um, the principle of the feminine coming up with all of the different threads to be able to more, uh, more clearly understand what's happening um, and, and how it can be seen and approached. That's not to say that I'm tying anything up in a bow, rather that I kind of hit the edge of my capacity to hold what we were talking about and wanted to point our attention to that. I was just thinking of uh, just female male uh, question and the stages. So I think it depends on where you are in, in the different layers. I, I think with blue or amber, till then reality or facts don't matter. It's it's just uh, who has the power says what's what's reality, and I think digression goes there. <laughs> so because I'm in the power, I want I want the reality to be like that, and and so I think it depends on the stages where where uh, female or male. Uh, expresses itself <laughs> so so I'm a little bit like if we only talk about male and female we miss a big part of what's going on and it, not only that it's <laughs> it's another many layers if we talk about integral um, and I was it just popped up um, Niobe way that's uh, um, a researcher, and she was was working on on uh, young boys, how, how they go through the adolescence uh, time, and she says boys and girls are born with the same possibility of empathy, and boys have good best friends. And they hug each other and, and they're really close. But through puberty, and not because of the hormones, but because of what's male and what's not. And you are, are you a girl or are you gay or whatever? So, so society presses on them not to be emphatic anymore. And, and, and what happens to, to boys when they grow up? So, and, and I think girls are not distorted that way. So that came to my mind as well. So if we relate to boys with all their cap cap capabilities, then, then there is a lot more that they can develop into than normal society, normal bringing up. Yeah, that's came to my mind when it comes to boys and girls. I want to say that I had an interview uh, with a colleague of John Bunsell. I've forgotten his, his name at the moment, and he has written books about that. What happens in UK uh, education centers with boys and uh, lifelong tra <laughs> trauma and when they are completely cut off their emotions deliberately as an education program. So I can't remember the name. I can send it and put it in the, in the, the chat.
Is anybody familiar with Carol Gilligan? She wrote a book called In a Different Voice, and she had been a mentee from, um, I think his first name was Eric Kohlberg, who developed the theory of uh, moral development. And so how we develop morals through uh, childhood. And he had a very male centric approach to how uh, moral decisions are made. And she studied in his lab and then she went out on her own and she studied how women make decisions. Um, and that's where she came up in a different uh, with this book called In a Different Voice. And her findings were that um, boys are taught um, to make moral decisions along the lines of rules and following structure um, and clear cut uh, boundaries. And girls um, will tend to make decisions uh, moral decisions based more upon uh, consensus and how people are going to feel about something. So um, if like if you think boys do a lot of sports and there's a lot of rules with sports, you can't play a game and not go by the rules. It, it kind of deteriorates. Whereas girls, when they play, they don't look to follow a lot of rules. Their natural play is a little bit more loose and not as many boundaries. Um, they don't try to establish, you know, very specific ways of having to go about things. And so this led to really kind of talking about um, moral development and moral decisions. And, and again, it's not to say that men can't have, uh, be inclusive and worry about people's feelings because they do. But this was something that, um, this was probably in the 60s and 70s. I would say when she wrote this up, it may have been the seventies when she actually wrote it. Um, but you know, these were the tendencies of what people, what children's play look like, what children's decision making look like. And this was, you know, not because they were in a particular school system, but these were the observations made about how boys and girls go about making decisions when they're uh, with their peers. So it was, it's interesting. Can you put her name in the chat and the book title? Would that lead to our uh, question of leadership uh, in adults? That women are not so fixed on what has to be done, but that they are more flexible in their decisions, as you also described about the beaches, although it was a man to decide it. Would that be the more feminine way? Yeah, to be um, less concerned with following a system or regulations and more uh, concerned about um, what's gonna be the impact on people with this type of a decision. Um, and these were moral decisions, um, not necessarily you know, scientifically based decisions. They were having to do with making a moral decision so but yeah i think it, i think it does relate to that and I, I think what she brought forward as well was as the waking up thing of the the spiral that as men and women wake up um their moral decision making might become more universal uh, and that's what I, I liked as well about her work uh, but it's the tipping point of the waking up that always intrigues me and what dominates. And we're still in a place where the waking up has not reached a tipping point, I would say. You mean waking up, but not in the Wilberian sense, in the Wilberian yes. sense of yes. growing up. You know, that sort of waking up, what is it, waking up, I never know the order, waking up, cleaning up, stepping up, cleaning up, you know, but, but just this thing about as you growing up, growing, <laughs> yeah, there's, there are different sort of playful things around that awakening through um, conscious development, you know, adult development, yeah.
it's interesting that you said that, uh, Christine, because my father. Uh, you've glitched, Gertrude. I'm not sure what's happening. We can't hear you, Gertrude. So maybe later you try again and. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, said, I said it's it's very interesting, Christine, that you said that because as children we always said my our father put principles over people. So it should be a certain way. It should be the Catholic way. It should be. So it was like even if. For example, he spanked us for something, and then he said, it hurts me um, even more than you. And I thought, bullshit. <laughs> but after a while, I realized he thought he had to do that because of the rules, because of the principles. So now that I'm grown, <laughs> grown up a little bit more, I, I understand that he had this conflict. On one side, he saw the human part, but he thought he had to do this. And, and that's interesting because that's really an example par excellence <laughs> for what you just talked about. No, we can't hear you again. That's uh, some glitch in the in the Zoom. <laughs> so we have talked about it uh, an hour. We can go ahead if you like. Otherwise, we could try to bind it together and come to an maybe find um, how can I say a summary of what we a collection of what we have touched so far. And I mean, it's an open discourse, no, which we are engaged in for a while, and we will be doing that in the future. Well, I think I I'm, I'm, so I'm kind of like Tammy, I'm kind of, um, I'm, I'm full after our hour together, so. Um, from an integral perspective, I guess we're saying that it's not either or, but it's and, that both types of leadership, uh, morality, moral making decisions, um, parenting uh, are needed. So, you know, integral theory would tell us to include it all and try to modulate so that one doesn't become too predominant and silence the other. I'm still uh, wondering about, because as far as we know, and if we remember September 11, um, the 11th of September, the construction of the World Trade Center, that many integrals dropped down two stages, at least in their consciousness. And now what we are trying, that people grow through a crisis. So maybe, and I wonder on what this depends, that you, a crisis makes you grow or makes you slide back in your development. Do you have any ideas about that? I think that is a very good topic for the next time. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, I would love to be a part of that conversation and 
you know, I'm, I'm just reflecting on the entry point of this conversation being coronavirus and, and uh, leadership of the feminine. And yeah, it, it, making something very specific cuts so much more away. And yet we are all um, it, at, at some level trying to really hold more. And so I'm, I guess I'm curious about um, this moment um, yes, we're, we're in a crisis, but it's also an excellent stopping of all things to be able to really look at ourselves. And, and I don't know how much gender has to do with that necessarily. I think it's a human uh, global stop moment. And, uh, and I think that there's a lot of different uh, types of communities that I've been involved in over the years that are looking at this and being like, oh my gosh, finally, now we can have some data to say what it is to not uh, run the cars and the airplanes. Uh, now we can look at uh, what the basis of the economy actually is and how that keeps us in perpetual slavery. And you know, what is the way that we're mediated in the world? And how can we have an effective voice in terms of policy and making decisions in these so-called democracies? These are all questions that I think we can, we, it's a great opportunity to look at what people have been doing all over the world in, uh, in many different levels and scales. So I, I see this as being an incredible opportunity uh, and I'm hopeful. And adding to that, I would uh, uh, say that I hope that there are enough people who see this as an opportunity and who will step up and go. Because Ken Wilber says we need 10% to change the world. And when we are there in 10%, then things can change. Instead, there is the tendency, and we talked about it, that things go back and people want to, to go to previous stages, uh, you know, because fear is what is doing that. So let's hope that enough people jump up. Well, I do think, not only I do hope, but I also think that people uh, are slowing down now. And uh, one point is that uh, uh, all the supermarkets and, and uh, the shops were rather disappointed that people didn't flock there when they opened up on Saturday. Every, they had opened up all the shopping centers, but didn't, people didn't flock there. They just uh, were just a couple of them. And first of all, I guess it's also viewing how mass tourism is really deforming uh, all of us, all our cities and uh, and how everybody is enjoying now the difference. So I wonder if this might really change, even if it's a small and minute possibility. That's why my final statement for today. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's uh, similar, like in the, in the Italian city Trieste or so, the for I'm ages they haven't seen dolphins there and all of a sudden you see them there or from Delhi you can see the Himalayan so it's kind of now before we took took it for granted then it has to be like that and and now I mean clear sky clear <laughs> clear view and and being able to breathe I mean this is quality and and people I think they they not only know about it but they experience it and and I think that's that's something different than than just talking about it and it should be different and now it is different and they say why should we go back to this normal thing and and so I think people slowed down had to slow down and kind of, like you said, uh, Monia, that 
comes into that we don't rush back to to the old way and i think there's a lot to to be changed because we don't need it and um and talking about what heidi said this um 10 yes but i i don't think it's only the quantity but the interconnectedness so when we were talking about unity and diversity it was like the the system of influence is first networking then uh, communities of practice and then the system of influence so the this third layer is needed to because the people are already there i think it's just the interconnectedness and knowing about each other and and um yeah supporting each other that also makes a big a huge difference even more than the only quantity of people scattered all over the world so so like people like we <laughs> from from all different uh, countries even even um continents yeah thank you very much ladies it was a great conversation thank you i'm just sensing into my body um i've got excitement inside of me on some level there's some excitement and the sense of rising of the body rising to whatever wants to be seen now and what the world's ready for. So I am, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for ladies like yourself with so much wisdom and for us being able to use technology in this way to come together. Um, and just to sense into the different parts of the world and what's happening there. And then something like this, that sort of whatever is happening locally, there is, that will push us, you know, this rising of whatever wants to rise now. That, and we spoke about it the first time we came together a month ago, is that, and, and Gertrude, you were speaking about that force when you give birth. It's a tremendous force. So I'm looking forward to that, whatever wants to birth now. And do you still want to contribute your? I think I, I think one of the things for me is is you know when your when your consciousness expands and and what we were saying around, it's true but partial. You know I, I find that sometimes my my head can hurt, with with seeing all of the possibilities and I'm temperamentally an optimist Barack Obama once said that about himself and that really resonated with me you know but there is an erosion of civil rights going on at the moment and and there are things happening and what you said Tammy about what was the word you used egregious of the media you know that that gave me goosebumps when you said that about um, the things that we might lose here as well as that we might gain and what I, I would love, I mean, I've been working with vaccinations for years, you know, around my husband had the swine flu vaccination was became seriously ill in 2010. And so I've been in that inquiry and um, there is a raising of awareness now about the challenges of vaccinations i'm not against vaccinations but i i certainly think a lot more transparency is needed and what's happening now is bringing it really to the fore so awareness is raising in all sorts of territories and i think worldviews are are being raised as well and it's kind of holding that optimism that some level of balance can come out of this moving forward and what you were saying Gertrude around the you know this whole thing about climate change and and you know what the others were saying about the the palpable benefits that are coming out of this if we could somehow hold that I was I held a call yesterday with elders and we looked into the concept of privilege and the concept of 
we are privileged in the sense of some of us are not majorly impacted by what is happening and others are life-threateningly impacted. And how do we hold the guilt around that was what we were talking about. Um, and not to let it close us down in our gift to life, you know, to keep finding ways to be of service. And then we talked about soulful service around how can we have the privilege of gifting all that we can into what's happening, you know? So it's a real complexity that sometimes I go, oh, how do I discern a clear path forward that I can live with? D, D by D. Thank you. And thank you, Heidi, always for bringing us together. And uh, I love the energy of us being together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. We have lost Christine. I don't know what has happened. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was a wonderful uh, conversation again. And I think there has already, also you, Anne, at the end, you gave a hint to another topic we could uh, explore in the in the future. No? And so let us come together again and talk about it. And for the moment, thank you. And we will meet. <laughs>